as time allows. But any questions that are not, don't get the chance to be asked, will be sent to the appropriate speaker and an answer forwarded to the person who's asked the question. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Una Porteous and I am the Policy Research Officer for the ARC Healthy Living Centre. The ARC has been open in Irvinstown in northwest Fermanagh for more than 20 years. Our work is around the mission of helping people to help themselves. So central to the culture of the organisation is empowering the community to improve their own situation. Fuel poverty is the focus for the ARC within this project. We have a remit to review current approaches to the issue of fuel poverty within the regions involved in the project and to influence policymakers around the area of fuel poverty. We believe that we need to have a practical approach that seeks to provide real help with this real problem. Within the Handy Heat project, we are one of seven partners. Our lead partner is the housing executive in Northern Ireland. Other partners include CLAR, a voluntary housing association based in Clare Morris, County Mayo, the Pure Energy Centre in Shetland, Luke, the Natural Resources Institute in Finland, Karelia University of Applied Science, also in Finland, and Oysterland's Energy Transition in Oysterbru, based in East Iceland. As part of our community engagement responsibility, we have planned this event to address the issue of fuel poverty, which in light of the current and ongoing challenges presented by COVID-19 may well become a reality for many more people this winter. We have an exciting lineup of experts to bring you their perspectives and advice this morning. First up, we will have Nicola McDowell from National Energy Action Northern Ireland. Nicola has been a training officer with NEA for more than three years and has a wealth of knowledge and experience before that in citizens' advice. Unfortunately, Nic Nicola cannot stay on the webinar much beyond her input. If you have an urgent question for Nicola, you can use the chat function and she will try and answer these before she has to leave. So Nicola, I'll stop sharing my screen and ask you to share yours. And of course, I've now realised I forgot to share my screen to show you all the timetable for today. But um, Nicola, I'll hand over to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. I'll just get this up. Can everybody see this okay? Yep. Yep. Okay, that's great. And I just move this out of the way a second. I'm just going to hide um, all your lovely faces simply because I just took the cover of my slides. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Una, for um, that lovely introduction. Um, I noticed a few familiar names and faces on today, so nice to see you all again. And hello to everybody who doesn't know um, me. So as Una said, I'm Nicola McDougall. I'm from National Energy Action and uh, I am their training officer. Hopefully, um, unfortunately, it's a wee bit brief this morning. Um, if, if anybody knows me, knows I'm a wee bit of a talker. So I'll try and be, um, uh, keep this condensed as much as I can. I'm going to just go through fuel poverty and health impacts in Northern Ireland and cover a wee bit of sort of energy efficiency. And anybody who has been at one of my talks before might be familiar with some of this, the stuff that I want to discuss today. So who are National Energy Action then? Um, we are the leading fuel poverty charity in Northern Ireland. We campaign at a national and regional and local level um, for the affordable warmth in the homes of vulnerable people. And we highlight the plight of those forced to live in cold, damp homes. And my role within NEA in Northern Ireland is I'm the, the training officer and I deliver, um, web, well, now it's webinars um, and, and qualifications as well in energy efficiency. So in Northern Ireland, we have our um, fuel poverty definition. And uh, it's different from England's definition. They have changed theirs, but at the, we are currently on the 10% definition. And that is if a household is in fuel poverty, in order to, to make several level temperatures throughout the home, 
occupants would have to spend more than 10% of their household income on all fuel use. Now that is, and that is aimed at 21 degrees in your main living area and 18 throughout the rest of the property. Now, the Northern Ireland House Condition Survey in 2016 um, found that 22% of the households in Northern Ireland were still um, under this definition. Now, that was a drop from 42% in the previous survey, but they, you know, we had to allow in that survey for the fact that uh, oil prices were at an all-time low. But it was encouraging to see that there was a drop. Um, the key findings of that report, and this survey is um, carried out every five years by the Housing Executive, were that, you know, not surprisingly, low-income families are families who are going to be at risk of being fuel poor. Um, those who are unemployed or retired. Um, if the head of the household was over 75 plus, there was um, more risk of being classified as fuel poor. Those in rural areas. Um, in particular, and those in very old, you know, homes, pre um, sort of 1919 dwellings, and that would be down to the fact that we're probably solid brick as well. So the results of that survey are, you know, are very good for us to, you know, to base um, some of our information on as well. So three, the three causes then of fuel poverty: energy and efficient home. If the home, you know, you or I or anyone, you know, you're working with is living in, um, has poor insulation, um, is drafty, has a, you know, um, an old heating system or just a very inefficient heating system, um, that home is going to be um, inefficient and costly to run. If you add in the fact that a lot of families are going to have a low income, and in Northern Ireland we do have, um, on average, lower incomes than the rest of the UK. You can see how straight away, if you've got a low income and it's going to cost you a lot more to keep the lights on and keep the heating on in your home, um, it, people are going to start struggling. And, you know, what concerns us even more is I was delivering, I've been delivering this training for a few years now and there was issues then. Now we've got the pandemic. So now we've got more people who have been, who are unemployed, with more people who've been furloughed, less money coming in. Um, and then if we add on top of that high fuel costs. Now, thankfully, some of the fuel costs have tariffs have come down. You know, your suppliers have you know, brought tariffs down. Oil dropped. But unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we've all been in our homes. And it's whole families in homes. It's not, um, we're working from home um, over, uh, for months, all the kids are at home. And if you've got a household, there's three or four kids, and two, you know, two or maybe three adults in that home. Obviously, there's, you know, there's more electricity usage. There's more, you know, heating the hot water, more showers. You know, so costs are going to go up, even though the tariffs have dropped. And coming into the winter, that is a big concern as well. So, what are the possible consequences then of fuel poverty? Well, if you heat the home, you could possibly get into fuel debt. And if you don't heat the home, your house could start getting into disrepair with uh, and and you know with condensation and dampness. Both of these scenarios can lead to ill health. We know there's lots of research, and even from my time in citizens' advice, there's lots of between debt and, and uh, in the impact that uh, the thought of getting into debt can have on somebody's you know um, mental illness and health. And if you're living in a cold, damp home. As we, we will come to in a, in a second, it can um, cause, you know, exacerbate or cause lots of additional ill health, and that is physical and mental um, issues. NEA um, had, carried out quite a bit of research, and they carried out a survey um, a year or so ago with their um, frontline workers and stakeholders to how would you recognise fuel poverty? And this is some of the findings. So going to bed early to stay warm, cooking using alternative sources such as a barbecue or a portable stove, using unsafe or unservice uh, heating appliances or inappropriate devices like ovens. Even one of my colleagues had a case where um, he was asked to, he had to go out and do a home visit and the gentleman didn't want to come into the house, but when he did get into the house, he had put the oven on to, you know, to warm the room up that they were going to sit in because his heating system 
was um, a broken down. So we get, you know, you would find that a lot. Not inviting friends or family into the home. Um, only heating one room or avoiding using central heating at all. You know, that's quite a common thing where we don't use a central heating system. We think that's going to cost us a lot more money, but then maybe we get like a, an electric fan heater or um, something that uses an awful, awful lot of electricity just to warm that one room. Cutting back on electricity and using candles instead of lights. Um, formal or informal borrowing from friends and family. Um, other coping methods were, you know, spending the day in heated areas, you know, going to the library, going to shopping centres. Unfortunately, those coping mechanisms now have been um, stopped because of COVID. A lot of people who may have gone out to the local library or shopping centre can't do that now. So they are going to have to spend more time maybe in that cold damp hole. And then cutting back on buying essential personal items. We have that, the saying, you know, heat or eat. And people do have to make those choices. Do they, um, you know, put money on the meter? Do they have any money for an oil fill? And remember, in Northern Ireland, 68% of the population, you know, the households use oil as their um, main heating. Uh, whereas in England, it's only 4%. So although the oil prices did come down there during the summer, it's still harder to find 100 or 200 pounds rather than maybe 10 pounds. So we do still have the issue with oil. And then, you know, some cases leaving, you know, curtains closed all day or putting newspapers over the window. So they were just some of the things that the survey found. So how are we going to tackle fuel poverty and get affordable warmth? So we need to improve the energy efficiency. And Energy and energy efficiency knowledge. We need to give people um, the knowledge and the confidence that they can make changes in their own behaviour and in their own lifestyle. And we're not talking, you know, solar panels and wind turbines. We're talking about the little things that can make a difference and can encourage people um, uh, to understand how to manage their um, heating better. So, energy advice. Um, uh, Northern Ireland um, Energy Advice Service there um, launched and they give really good advice on the different grants and they, their uh, advisors can give people tips on you know, insulation and heating, etc. Income maximisation. Again, we've got in very good independent advice services around Northern Ireland. Um, can give free benefit checks. I'm always encouraging people Look, get your free benefit check. Even if when you're on benefits, go and you know get a check just to make sure because that you know additional premium on your benefits can make a difference. You know, um, uh, to somebody who maybe is struggling on a low income, and also getting tips on how to budget better. And if somebody is in, you know, is worried about getting into debt or is in debt, making sure they're contacting their supplier and also they get advice from uh, the likes of the independent advice agencies. Um, and then energy advice. So ourselves, NEA, we can provide you know, talks and we can provide energy advice and give advice um, on using heating systems. The likes um, of Consumer Council, um, they have, you know, they'll give uh, the tip on switching and they have the excellent service of showing you, you know, the oil prices in the area so you can make sure that you're getting the best thing. Um, and again, there's lots of information out there from the Energy Saving Trust to Energy Action Scotland have fantastic um, videos showing people how to actually, you know, use their heating system, give them the confidence to actually understand the controls, you know, um, how best to set their heating um, in, a, in a nice straightforward manner that's, you know, not overly complicated. So we're moving on to the health impacts of living in a cold, damp home. So these are the um, uh, indoor temperatures and effects on health. And lots of research has gone into showing you the impact that living at colder temperatures can have on your health. So if you're a healthy person living between 18 and 24 degrees, is it no risk? But once those temperatures start to drop, you now have less resistance to respiratory um, problems. And that, you know, again, we've got the addition of COVID this year. You know, so we do, we do need to make sure that people are not living in the, those sort of temperatures as well as all the infections around. Um, increased blood pressure. I mean, if temperatures drop below 12, increased blood pressure, then it can lead to heart attack and, um, and strokes. There are, you know, lots of research to show that even 
a, in a mild winter, if there's a temperature drop outside, you know, two days after it will find there's more people admitted to hospital before heart attack. So um, there's a direct link there. Um, after two or more hours, basically you're heating the room that you're in, you know, your um, deep body temperature starts to fall. And then after that, we get um, to below um, six degrees, we've got risk of hypothermia. So what are the health conditions that this can um, exacerbate? You know, asthma, particularly in young kids. If you have young kids that, you know, their, their research shows that young kids living in cold, damp conditions will be admitted to hospital with more, with asthma, you know, and uh, there's uh, eczema issues there too, um, and skin complaints, and a lot more um, sickness in young, in young children. Um, colds and flu, bronchitis, coronary heart disease, Worsening of long-term illnesses in winter and slow recovery. If your body is um, just working on keeping you warm, it's not getting you well. And you know, there's research by from Macmillan, you know, that long-term exposure to cold acts as, a, as it suppresses the immune system. We've also got falls and accidents. Um, when you're cold, you you know, you don't move as well, um, and so it'd be easier easy easier for people to you know trip over and fall. I often wonder if you know someone, an older person in particular, goes into hospital because they've maybe fallen. Do they just assume that it's because they're an older person and we're frailer when we get older? Has anybody actually found out whether that person is living in a very cold home? And then other things like I'd mentioned earlier, mental, you know, mental health illness, poor nutrition or you know the heat or eat. Um, scenario and where people you know will maybe buy cheaper food as well because they you know they can't afford um better nutrition and then the risk of carbon monoxide poisoning from not getting you know boiler serviced or the chim you know if it's the chimney swept such also want to highlight mold growth so mold growth again is one of those things that's so you know dangerous to particularly people who've got respiratory conditions um, and it's, it's an extreme health hazard. So it's highlighting to people not to turn on, you know, in rooms that are prone to getting mold or damp, to not turn the heating off completely in those rooms and to making sure that there is ventilation in those rooms as well. In certain cases, it's impossible, um, but it's highlighting that that's actually, it's very dangerous to have that um, for your uh, respiratory health. So who's most at risk then? Um, people who spend a high proportion of time, you know, in home. And again, with uh, COVID, we're all spending a lot more time, you know, at home. So older people, children, adults with disabilities, long-term health conditions, and people who are socially isolated. These are the people who are disproportionately affected um, uh, and, and with cold, damp housing. So it's more important ever this year to stay protected against the drop in temperature as cold weather can affect your body's ability to fight off viruses and infections. By keeping warm, you can help yourself stay well this winter. So what then, what, you know, what things can we do? And energy efficiency is one way of combating fuel poverty. So what, you know, why is it important? Well, it can bring about affordable warmth. It can help reduce our energy use. It can cut the fuel bills, it saves money, we stay healthy, and we're protecting the environment. Remember, we have these um, massive targets that we have to meet by 2050. Um, and therefore, you know, you know, everybody you know, playing a part can, could make a difference. So I'm going to look at some uh, no cost, no cost ways to save energy. Now I have picked up some brilliant tips over my last few the last few years of going out and doing a lot of these talks to um, community groups, and I'll try and share a few of those um, with you all. So our no cost savers um, get free energy advice. You know I'd mentioned during the Northern Ireland um, Energy um, Advice Service, and you know it's. People can you know, contact them by email or phone and they're there to provide um, free energy advice and they will give people advice on the insulation and heating schemes. NEA um, can also assist there as well. Um, control your heating just by turning down your um, thermostat. And most thermostats you will find will be in you know, the hall of most homes. Turning them down just by one degree 
can save over eighty pounds a year. So that's you know that's an easy that could be an easy win. Um, and some you know some households have theirs up sitting up at twenty four twenty five degrees. So you know there could be um, savings there to be made. Turn off the standby. And um, as already said, more than ever we are at home. We have that many electronic devices, so many more than maybe had when um, I was young. If we're all working from home, making sure we're turning off the laptops completely, not leaving your screensaver is still using a level of electricity. I'm sure everyone in the household has a mobile phone or maybe a tablet, making sure that the chargers aren't left on and switched on. You know, just all these little things can make a difference. Other things to point out, you know, closed curtains and doors particularly come into this time of year. Um, and when there is a bit of even a bit of winter sun, actually open the curtains and get some of that um, free heat into the home. Uh, switch off the lights you don't need. Um, anybody who's ever been at my previous talks, I do always mention Blackpool Illuminations. My, um, my dear old dad used to regularly shout that at us, you know, this house looks like Blackpool Illuminations. And I have recently said that to my daughter and she doesn't actually know what I'm talking about. She never heard of Blackpool Illuminations, so I'd have to change that one for her. But lights, 15% of your electricity bill is your lights. So, you know, and I know that, you know, recently just from working from home, I've even had the lights, you know, I've put my lights on during the day. So that's where you need to think of, you know, looking at, you know, changing the bulbs to the LEDs. And I'll get to that in a second. Um, use the microwave for reheating. Boiling only the water you need in the kettle. One lovely lady, um, um, you know, informed me that, her and her husband have their two favourite mugs and in the morning they just fill those mugs up with the water and put that in the kettle. They never overfill the kettle. Um, spend less time you need in the electric shower as well. Um, electric showers are probably one of the things in the house that will cost you the most if they're uh, used a lot. So if you've got you know any teenagers or anything in the home that are in the shower for 15 or 20 minutes, getting them to cut the showers down dramatically will save you money over the year. And, you know, most importantly, check your bills, check your fuel bills. Even though, you know, the likes of myself, I have to remind myself, I get mine, I get an e-bill, and sometimes you get that email in and you don't even look at it. But just checking your bills, making sure you look accurate enough, making sure you're putting in your media readings. Um, I come across, you know, so many occasions where uh, people have, you know, estimated readings and then end up with a big bill at the end or that they find they've actually been paying too much. So just, you know, um, keeping in control and understanding, you know, what you're paying for. No cost ways then to save energy. If you have um, a hot water cylinder, make sure it's got a jacket on it. And if it doesn't get one, you can make good savings there. Um, they're not for drying pajamas on, as one um, lovely lady told me once. Um, draft proofing, you can do this yourself or you can get somebody in to do this. But again, you know, one of the best ways to find out where you need to draft proof is on a windy day. And we have quite a few of those in Northern Ireland. So, you know, things like if you have an unused chimney, make sure that you have it blocked off. Um, you know, even keyholes in doors, letter boxes, um, making sure all those little things are um, sorted out will make such a difference to you know the heat of the home. Um, loft insulation, the you know the recommended is two hundred and seventy uh, millimeters to three hundred. So making sure it's topped up and well insulated, and make sure even the likes of the loft hatch is insulated as well. Secondary glazing, there's levels of it. You know, um, at its most basic. It can. It looks like cling film stuck around the window, but it can be a temporary fix until maybe someone can afford um, or is maybe eligible to get you know um, some support to get their windows replaced. But again, it, you know there there are um, benefits to it um, temp for temporary reasons. Your controls in your home. It's essential that people get the hang of using the controls in their home because it will save them money. Um, so your thermostatic radiator valves, you know, may, we don't encourage that they are turned off completely in rooms that aren't in use that they're on because, you know, lack of heat, lack of ventilation, 
and excessive moisture do cause condensation and dampness. So having an, even a tiny bit of heat coming into the room um, can help, you know, keep that at bay. Um, but making sure, you know, that you're, you're aware of the thermostats in your boiler, you know, thermostats on if you've got your hot water cylinder, that they're all set right. Um, and don't be afraid to um, have a look at them and, you know, you know set them. Um, there are lots of videos on the likes of YouTube and then I think it's Energy Action Scotland have very good informative videos of how to um, set all of those. Your low energy light bulbs, um, they've all come down in price. You can get every size and shape that you want. Um, and again, they estimate that if, if you're replacing the old incandescent bulb with an LED bulb, you could be saving two to three pounds a year. So, you know, I, and again, you can buy, I mean, I think I bought a big box of them recently on Amazon. My husband's an electrician and he gets them on screw fix. So they're, they, they are, they have down a price and they will save a lot of money. And again, regular servicing of central heating and appliances to make sure that they're working at their most efficient. The grants and schemes then that are available in Northern Ireland, we have the Affordable Warrant Scheme. Again, this is open to private tenants and owner occupiers. It's a targeted initiative for specific areas of high fuel poverty. They do take some referrals, but it's mostly targeted. Um, and again, you know, get in contact with your local council um, for and or the Northern Ireland Energy um, address and can give more information about that too. Um, NICEP is the Northern Ireland Sustainable Energy Program. Again, it um, runs on a financial year basis. It's a customer funded program and it provides energy efficiency measures. Now, this is a limited fund, and so you know there are waiting lists that does fill up. Um, but people should could look into it again to see if they might be eligible for that. And then we have the boiler replacement scheme um, as well. And again, you know, it, again, there's it's for boilers that are maybe 15 years or older or, you know, are beyond a repair and your income needs to be less than 40,000. But again, the um, Northern Ireland Housing Executive's Energy Advice can give people all the details regarding that or it's on um, the website as well. For further information, you know, for the likes of, uh, if you've got complaints maybe with your supplier or, you know, you want to switch or anything regarding energy, the consumer accounts are always very useful and very helpful to go to. Um, and then there's the likes of uh, ourselves, particularly of projects in the Belfast area. I also like to highlight the customer care register, particularly now because of COVID. Customer care register um, is, uh, for, is provided by the electricity and gas suppliers. It's part of their code of practice and it's for their customers who are of pensionable age, disabled or chronically sick but you have to register the, uh, register with them. And if you switch from one provider to the next, you have to register with the um, new provider. And they can provide you know, assistance and, and um, services you know, when certain, you know, in certain cases, maybe organizing to get a meter move, they can you know, provide information you know, um, in different formats, um, bills and uh, they can actually do you know, media ratings, etc. So there's lots of different things that they can they can do to um, help their customers. The other thing is in terms of COVID, it meant that they had a list of people who they knew were their most vulnerable, so they could contact them and keep in contact with them um, for those who might have been concerned about topping up their meters or worried about their bills, etc. We also then have the Northern Ireland. Um, uh, Electricity Network's Critical Care Register. And again, this is another one and it's very important that people who require um, a life support and um, electrical equipment need to be on because they will get up-to-date information by phone on planned power cuts or interruptions. Um, and we know that there, you know, we know there are quite a lot of people who need this kind of equipment who are not on this register. So it's important to try and encourage people to get on these free registers. Um, only recently, I think as early as last week, the, um, the gas network operators and suppliers have got together and they've developed um, a website and it's a one-stop support hub for natural gas customers. So there's lots of information on there. Um, 
you know, code practice, payment and meters, energy bill support, energy efficiency top tips are on there, um, and then additional support services. So this is just to help those customers out there who need, need a wee bit of additional support, um, and it was in light of uh, you know, the COVID pandemic. Um, Advice MI also they have to have their community helpline in terms of coronavirus community support, and they will direct people to you know refer people on to the right um, ones in terms of heating and benefits um, and money and debt. So you know there there is definitely a lot of support right there. Um, I also wanted to highlight our uh, the NEA's Belfast Warm and Well project. So it is. Um, run uh, by NEA and it's uh, supported by the Public Health Agency and Belfast Community Planning Partnership and we're given support and advice directly to the public or organisations working directly with the public at risk of living in fuel poverty. Now it's a Belfast based project um, currently but if anybody's interested in it they can give us a call um, and the aim is to help local people struggling to keep their home warm by offering advice and practical support to stay warm and well and where appropriate the provision of heating measures and discretionary financial assistance uh, subject to assessment to alleviate the effects of living in a cold damp home. And it's, this project has now been extended because um, it was, uh, you know, it was very, um, it's a very well run project and it's um, worked very, very well over the past six months in particular, um, supporting people through the very difficult time. My last few slides then, we all know the saying, the home is where the heart is, but this year more than ever, home is where the heat is. And that's me, and thank you for listening. And I think I should be able to take questions if anybody has any for the next sort of five minutes. Nicola, sorry, can I, can I just, first of all, thank you for that presentation. Um, you mentioned in one of your early slides that uh, the rate of uh, people living in fuel poverty had dropped from, I think you said 44 to 20. Yeah, 42 to 22. Um, obviously, you know, the, the do you think there'll be a significant improvement as we move forward? I suppose, do you think that the, the measures that are in place to address the, the three core problems with, um, with fuel poverty, do you think we're... It's just looking one in it because when you look, at, when you break down those statistics to area, mm -hmm. there's been improvements in some and not great improvements in others. So hopefully, you know, I would hopefully it will. I don't know what the impact of COVID is going to have because it's slowed down. I mean, you know, all, a lot of the, you know, NICEP and affordable warmth and all the going in, they were only doing emergencies. So a lot of that has been, you know, progress has been slowed down. So it, it would be fantastic if it had dropped. And again, you know, my concern is that we've still got this 68% of people on oil. You know, and that it doesn't seem to change. You know, even though the gas infrastructure is extending across, you know, Northern Ireland. Um, so there are, you know, I do have my concerns. We do need to keep, you know, those schemes and you know grants available for people. But I think um, at this time, just if we're going to go into a huge recession as well as they're predicting, it is. It unfortunately, it is worrying times. You know, just a point of information, the gas network is not extending right throughout Northern Ireland. North yes. Armagh is not included, nor is West Tyrone. Mm -hmm. The ridiculous yeah. thing is that it has gone down the Clougher Valley and it has come right across over to outside Fintan, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, for the sake of another 18 miles and you're into the other third mm -hmm. main Conor Basin in, in Fermanagh, I don't think saying that... <laughs> Saying this to skis, <laughs> who knows what I'm talking about? <laughs> they, uh, no, it's just that, that there's a major concern I would have personally, not only around energy and in North Fermanagh, but the whole 
mainline services seem to be being neglected into the West and in particularly into North Fermanagh. We ramp over. No, Hello. no. Can I, sorry, could I just add there to uh, Manix, you got in before me. That's exactly what I was going to say. I, I don't think people have any alternative other than oil yeah. here. Yeah, you know, oh, totally. And I do know there's concerns now as well where because we're, you know, we're looking to the future, people are thinking, well, should it change from oil to gas if we're going to change it again? You know, if we have to go to hydrogen or, you know, whatever the you know, ideas are down the line. So I know there are concerns, you know, people are concerned about things like that as well. Um, and I mean, there's, you know, if you've got a very, you know, efficient energy, efficient boiler, brand new oil one, why would, um, if you could, you know, if you can't afford it, you're not going to change it either. So, yeah, totally understand. I totally understand where you're coming from too. Yeah, I see in the in the chat box there, um, Garrett has made the point that as we move towards zero carbon targets, what will happen to all the gas boilers that are being installed at the minute? And I think you know, while gas certainly provides a, a controlled cost fuel option, um, it isn't you know, it's in the longer term, it's yeah. in its present state, it's not any more sustainable or any more um, desirable, mm -hmm. if you like. It, it it can be beneficial, obviously, but um, it's not. It's certainly not going to move us towards twenty fifty targets by much. No. But um, also, Nicholas, uh, Nicholas, someone has thanked you for. Or Vanda has thanked you, and can we share your email address once more? Um, yes. You can type yes. them into the comments if you like. Yeah. Um, all right. Are there any other questions for Nicola? No. Okay, Nicola, well, it just remains to thank you and to release you from, from your commitment. <laughs> All right, thank you very much for, the, for no that. And good luck with the rest of the session. On, um, I'm disappointed that I can't stay on and listen to the rest of the presentations, but. I'm sure they'll all be very well worthwhile. Yeah. Well, you, you may all notice at the top uh, left of your screen, there's a little red button. The, the event this morning is being recorded and will be available afterwards for anybody who hasn't been able to make it. But um, let us move on. So, Nicola, thank you very much. No problem. You. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye bye. So I'm sure we've all taken some very useful um, information from Nicola's presentation. And uh, I would now like to introduce you to our next speaker, John Flynn. John, having worked in banking for a number of years, has moved to the public sector and has been working with SEAI, uh, the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland, for a number of years. And John will give us his perspective on energy usage, issues of sustainability and smart meters and uh, it will be useful information, especially as we face into the winter months. So, John, over to you. Hey, thanks very much. I've just put the uh, my video on just for a moment, so you can all see me. I'm going to turn it off because uh, my Wi-Fi is not particularly strong, uh, and I'm going to start the presentation. Okay. You might just let me know if you can see that. Is that coming through there? Not, not yet. No. Have you clicked? You have clicked share share screen yet? Yeah. Just try it again. There we go. Okay. Two now. Excellent. Okay. Uh, so SAI, we are the uh, national advisors to the Irish government. Um, uh, we advise on energy policy and implement a lot of uh, government programs. My role is I work in the communities uh, grant scheme. Uh, I've previously worked in the warmer homes, which is a fuel poverty element, and I've previously worked in SCI's financial control. Um, 
I'll briefly just mention communities. Uh, I'm not doing a huge presentation on it, but communities, the communities program looks to engage um, towns, villages, and what we are trying to do is we're trying to get public sector, private sector, voluntary sector, and homes all into one grant scheme and we provide supports then from 30 to 50 percent for private and uh, community sector buildings and up to 80 percent funding for works in fuel poor homes so i give it more people information on that should they wish but that's not really what i'm here to uh, present on today and during my presentation uh, i'm going to touch on uh, reducing energy uh, smart metering uh, just transition, which is the new buzzword coming in with the fuel poverty arena. Um, I was interested in the previous discussions that nobody mentioned electrification of heating uh, or transport. Uh, I'll touch on those and I'll briefly touch on grant supports that SCI offer. Um, during the presentation, I'm going to be asking lots of questions. Um, some of the questions I might have answers to, but others I don't. Um, so what uses energy? <clears throat> uh, typically, we've sat down in front of uh, financial controllers of very large organizations and they come in, they say we're spending half a million, million euro on, on energy, we want to save, save money. That's great, but do you know what is causing you or where you're spending this, this huge amount of money? And sometimes the answer is no, they don't. Uh, so they need to understand that we all need to understand uh, where we're using energy and um, it's not just electricity, it is heating and other sources. Cooling, for example, for large organizations can also be a significant cost. Uh, when do we use, uh, how do we use less and can we use less? And there are two very important questions when we come down to speak about fuel poverty. Um, how do you use less? And Nicola touched on the very simple uh, things to do, um, not overfilling the kettle, turning off the lights. Um, and we're now seeing the transition to, uh, to smarter. Uh, when we mean smarter, we mean more intelligent um, pieces of equipment. I'll touch on smart grids later on, but a simple thing like night saver meters, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, actually, it's only a good thing if you know how to use it. And there's no point in people putting in different types of meters unless they have, number one, the intelligence. And I don't mean that by um, uh, the, the, the know, I mean the know-how uh, and, the, and the information and the awareness of how do I use this piece of equipment to save me money? Uh, like if you sit in the driveway and drive your car, or not drive your car, but you just rev the engine, they'll use a lot of diesel. Um, whereas if you drive in the motorway at a reasonable speed, it works very efficiently. And um, when we ask about fuel poverty, can we use less? We 20 years ago, when we started the, the warmer home scheme, would say to clients, well, we'll come in and do energy works in your home the basics that Nicola was speaking about previously, and we would um, save you money. And actually we've realized that that is not really the case. Uh, the information and the analysis that we've done subsequent to that is that we don't actually save them a huge amount of money. It's very marginal. What we do see is that the environment, their living environment, their quality of life is significantly improved. And that is a huge plus uh, for society. And it is a very significant benefit. Um, and that's why I suggest that using, there comes a point where you can't use any less. Uh, so wearing hats and coats in the, in the house and going to bed early, uh, it's just not a way to live. So we talk about intelligence. Um, here's a really simple thing. This is an energy monitor picture there on the uh, right hand side. And it is telling you, the homeowner, about the energy usage. And that's what I have in my own home. And it tells you the cost. So that energy monitor is telling me that I'm using 1.1 kilowatts uh, of electricity. And it's cost me about 20 cent per hour 
Um, so if I notice machine on, that's fine. But if there was no machine on in my house, I'd probably want to know why I was using 1.1 kilowatts. It's also a useful tool where people put on the lights of showers and kettles who are not uh, energy savvy. Um, so you turn on a kettle, you can see it's going to go to 3, 3.5 kilowatts. What does that mean? Well, it actually means it costs you about 60 cents per hour. If your kettle is running for 15 minutes because you filled it, you can now do a very simple calculation. And this is how we should be informing clients and people about what energy are you using and what's the cost. Um, and it's a very simple device. I've installed it myself and I'm by no manner of means technical. But it's just it providing people with the intelligence that I've spoken about um, and giving them information that they can make informed decisions. Now I'm going to talk about smart metering because smart metering is coming at us. And there are questions around smart metering is that I have. Uh, I'm going to be honest and say that. It's been sold to us as uh, providing uh, us, the great unwashed general public, with the information. And again, we're using the word intelligence to, to use energy more efficiently, uh, more effectively, and cost us less money. That's great. Sounds great. Um, but the piece of kit on the left hand side is the smart meter. That's great. You know, it's a big piece of kit that hopefully none of us will ever have to look at. But the piece on the right is the smart bit. Gives us the intelligence, tells us how much we're using, tells us how much it's going to cost. Because the, the rates of energy and the rates of electricity will vary depending on the cost of generation. And that's the way it will be going forward. That's great if you, you have a discretionary choice. What do I mean by that? Well, you, you have a fridge, you need the milk to be cold because otherwise it'll spoil. And that fridge needs to be on 24 seven. Doesn't matter how much it costs to run today, this hour or the next hour, that fridge needs to be on. Where it does make a difference, however, is the likes of uh, washing machines and other appliances which may be used at, dis at discretionary times. I don't know about you, but my home is about 20 years old and when we moved in, we bought a lot of equipment and it all seemed to fail at the same time. And we're now buying appliances that allows us to use timers. And at the moment I have a night saver meter, which means that once I use electricity in the middle of the night, I get a cheaper rate. These smart meters are suggesting that uh, we will use electricity every half hour, or the rate will be set every half hour or so. And we can therefore have the discretion to turn on the dishwasher. But actually that's a three hour cycle. So what happens if the price spikes in the middle of the three hour cycle? So hopefully um, that issue will be resolved and that the time frames will be far more adaptable to allow for large, heavy appliances to be used uh, at an effective time. And that's where we start making uh, savings and clients, people, and the, the general public can make savings. There's some points about smart meters. It will benefit the national grid. Energy, uh, the way we generate uh, electricity, uh, costs a huge amount to have what we call a base load and uh, to make sure we satisfy all the requirements and the grid doesn't fall over. Uh, it costs a lot of money to have big kit on standby. These are multi-million euro prod pieces of kit standing by and it's not as if they can just stand idle for years. They have to be brought into use and it depends on the energy mix as the cost of energy. Wind is clearly uh, relatively cheap, but if wind is not blowing, we have to burn gas and oil and other products to generate electricity. So it can benefit households if you have the information and the intelligence and the, uh, to, to make these discretionary uh, decisions. But we're clearly we're not going to be looking at these dials at four o'clock in the morning when uh, it's really cheap to generate electricity and the electricity demand is probably going to be particularly low. It can identify to us high and high areas of demand and indicate charges accordingly. Simple things like 
the National Grid will tell you that if there's a big episode or a big story in Coronation Street or EastEnders, the minute that ends, there is a spike because everybody goes and makes a cup of tea afterwards. So small things like that, you know, hopefully these smart grids can start indicating that, you know, don't boil the kettle now because it's going to be expensive delay for a period of a half hour or so. And, and this balances out the cost of generating electricity to supply the entire country. So just transition. And these are buzzwords that you, you're going to hear and certainly was uh, uh, the recent budget that was published by the uh, Southern Irish government. Uh, there was a lot of just transition language being used and I put to electrification on it because that is the national policy in the Republic. So what is a just transition? Um, so the first thing that the Irish government did with the climate action bill was to increase uh, carbon, carbon tax on fuels. So diesel, oil, home heating oil, uh, coal, anything that generates um, carbon will now have an increased tariff. That's fine if you have options, but you know, you know the likes of cars, we're not all going to run out by electric cars. They're very, very expensive. If you have an oil heating system, you're not going to run out and change it unless it starts to fail. And I was in that boat myself a couple of years ago. So you have to, there are points where we have decisions uh, and they're expensive decisions. So just transition is a way of trying to mitigate the higher costs that people will have and try and encourage people over time to move to uh, renewable um, sources of generating heat for, your, for both your home and uh, in the use of transport. This is effect, but well, it's actually going to affect us all very slowly over a long period of time. And that's why it started now. Uh, and that's why the carbon taxes are not just going into the public kitty. Um, an example of to just transition and the approach of the Irish government to just transition is as the carbon taxes were increased, they increased the fuel allowance, which is paid to people who are deemed to be in energy poverty. They've also increased the amount of money available to the Warmer Home Scheme, which addresses people in fuel poverty. Uh, and that budget increased from 50 to 100 million euro. So they're trying to address, um, as we increase carbon taxes, they are trying to identify those people who may be most affected. Um, for the rest of us, though, they'll simply make uh, burning of fossil fuels in whatever manner or shape we do more expensive to encourage us to make more informed purchase decisions uh, as we tra transgress to this new uh, zero carbon environment. So there's just two images of what we're talking about, the electric vehicle over there. As I said, there was just talk of uh, these being quite standard. That electric vehicle is the new Volkswagen ID3, 44,000 euro, quite a sizable chunk of change, even with the grant of 5,000 euro. Um, to give you some sort of comparison, that vehicle is probably just marginally smaller than the standard Volkswagen Golf, and you can get a petrol Volkswagen Golf for 25 grand. So there's 20,000 euro of an investment cost required for you to transition to this new Nirvana. Um, not cheap. On the left hand side is a heat pump, uh, which is what we, we are encouraging people to start thinking about heating your homes. And it was a great, uh, great comment from somebody earlier on where they talked about oil and their boiler being uh, 90 odd percent efficient and why would you change it and you wouldn't let's be clear you wouldn't change it but someday that oil boiler will fail it will need to be replaced and that is the decision point do I now make a decision to go for this electrification system or not uh, and it's not just a case of swapping out one piece of kit for another your home needs to be ready for this it is a different way of heating your home you also need to think about energy differently. Uh, these things run 24 seven. So your home is at that particular heat range 
all day, every day, even when you're not here, uh, and even when you're not at home. So you do need to think about these type of decisions. Uh, and as I say, they're not for every day. They are for decision points when equipment starts to fall over and fail. So electrification, I've mentioned a couple of things and you know, just talk about zero carbon 2050, all these things. It will change the way we heat our homes and that will require, number one, your homes to be heat pump ready is the term we're using. It also requires a change of mindset. The way you heat your home with a heat pump is completely different to the way you heat your home with oil or gas or coal. It will require changes to transportation uh, as we move to electric vehicles. Uh, anybody who's electric vehicle now will know about range anxiety where how am I going to get my next um, charge if you do not have a domestic charger. We also need to think about how the grid stands up to all of this electrical generation. Um, so what happens when we're using all this electricity for heat and to power our cars? And the simple example we use is in, in the January or December or one of the very cold months, the, you might get a nice day, the wind is not blowing, it might be sunny. Uh, do we now switch on all the gas and the oil uh, systems to generate electricity for the for the grid, or do we just rely on our friends in the UK and import their nuclear fuel that, that they uh, that they will give us? And we do have interconnectors to France and to to the UK. Um, so there are grid issues. Um, the grid was built many many years ago. It, it it requires a huge amount of maintenance, a huge amount of administration, a huge amount of cost to upgrade. Um, there are demand issues as we see population growth. And what we think we see coming forward is generation locally. The current grid is supported by, say, maybe 10 to 20 very large plants dotted strategically across the country. And actually, that's probably not going to be sustainable going forward. We're probably going to be generating electricity in the local town, uh, depending on size of town. But generally speaking, we are going to have to be able to generate electricity local to us and use locally. And that op opens up opportunities for the communities. And we've seen communities across Europe who can start to operate and run their own plant uh, by getting community buy-in uh, to run these particular pieces of, piece of large kit. So as I said, there's huge capital cost in changing vehicles for these new type of vehicles. And also in uh, changing your home, your home will have to be upgraded if you have an old home to be uh, energy efficient uh, before you can consider putting in one of these new devices. So SCI offers grants for insulation, uh, for the buying of the kit, the heat pump itself, air tightness, which is critical, windows and doors and some programs, that's key, especially with old buildings. They need to be airtight. They need, you need to know when you generate electricity or generate heat through electricity, which is at a much lower level of heat than we're used to, that it stays within the home and doesn't, isn't just blown out the window because of badly fitting windows. With cars, we've seen the changing of the VRT, the last uh, budget, uh, and there's uh, domestic charger grants as supports for the EVs. And that's it. That's all I have. I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank you very much, John. Um, I suppose one of the one of the key points that you made was the the intelligent use of equipment. And I see someone has asked in the in the questions there about the. Um, do we have uh, different rates at different times, for, for night saver rates in Fermanagh, and about the concerns about using equipment at night due to electrical faults? Um, and I know there are you know concerns over things like dishwashers. Have you have you any thoughts on that? As you know, are there issues? Are there issues around that? I know you can't answer about the the rates at the night saver rates in Fermanagh, and that's something that will probably come up. Uh, with our next presenter, but um, do you have any comments about you know concerns over using equipment at night when there if there are cheaper rates for use? 
Yeah, well, there's, no, there's no question that you know, using electrical equipment is a you know a, a potential risk. But these new appliances are designed to run when you know you're not necessarily on site. You know, you do. I think every home. I've only just recently checked my own fire um, um, fire alarms within the home to make sure that they are up or all operational and all uh, appropriately set. So, and that's what I mean. It's very easy to say run your equipment late at night, but run your equipment at any time. Um, can pose a risk and we just need to be to be aware of that very unlikely that new equipment unless it's really badly used or really badly maintained would go up in flames the dryer is probably the one one that will be at, at most risk because it's using heat uh, washing machines are, and uh, the others use water so chances are your electrical fuel out before you'd go on fire to be honest yeah and the other question there is, you know, the cost of smart meters and, uh, you know, are they affordable for families? Are they free? Uh, I know that, you know, I've seen them installed by, by your electricity supplier, but I think there is an additional cost to them. They're not, they're not routinely free. My understanding is that the, the, the will be installed free of charge. Uh, whether the, the display unit is, is an extra fee, I, I'm not sure, to be honest. Uh, they've only just started putting in the smart meters. My understanding was that the, the, the meter uh, for the client's use in the home would be made available uh, for free, but I can't, can't say that for sure. Okay, thank you. And uh, then there's a question here. Does anyone have thoughts on moving to hydrogen fueled gas appliances? or low carbon liquid fuels for oil burners such as HVO? So we've heard a lot of talk about hydrogen. I know it's, it's um, I was on a, another European call uh, and they do a lot of it in Scotland. We have no infrastructure built for hydrogen uh, in the South. I can only speak for the South. Uh, and as to whether we use hydrogen or not, it, maybe it's possible for our fleet or public fleet to use it. But yes. uh, there's no infrastructure built for hydrogen and no intention to do so. Yeah, no, I, I know um, that they're using it fairly extensively in Scotland uh, yeah. on, some of, on some of the larger bus fleets, certainly around Aberdeen. Uh, yeah. But yeah, there's, it's, not, it's not being looked at mainstream here yet. Um, I think the Irish person, I know they've started looking at an electric vehicle and... Um, it was quite funny. My my son is is in that sphere. He's working as a mechanic, and they, he was laughing that they they were powering the bus, the electric bus, by using a diesel generator. Okay, right. Thank you. And I see uh, just that uh, our response has come in from Gemma there that remote smart heating controls are available under the NICEP schemes in Northern Ireland. Um, they're a great, great way to reduce energy costs. Yeah, that's that's where people have, you know, uh, you know, if you're not at home, you can turn it off on your phone and stuff. It's a fantastic energy saving device. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and then Ryan has said there's a big push towards air source heat pumps as the main technology promoted in electrification of heat. Are there any publications available on the financial and environmental models that can be achieved by ASHP in Ireland with actual COP? levels achieved? Uh, we're doing a study uh, within Ireland. We, we support both air and water, air to water and air to air uh, heat pumps within the grant schemes that we operate and we will be and are doing studies to make sure that the COP being published by the manufacturers is accurate. So hopefully we'll have some more data on that in the coming year or so. Okay, thank you. Is that Amy, have I covered all, have I asked all those questions? There are a couple, of, I hope you can all see the chat line and um, if there are any, any other questions you can put in there. Um, I see Catherine has mentioned that the EU, the Handy Heat project is um, currently trialing the electrification of heat in six households in Lisnesky as part of the, the project. Um, and you can see they're listed the the aims are to reduce carbon, uh, to improve thermal comfort, reduce poverty levels, and make technology work for householders. 
And I think, I suppose, you know, one of the biggest things um, that John has mentioned really is th th that need for behavioural change, uh, which is something that, that we all have within our own um, gift. There's a couple more questions there. Um, Gem is saying, Belfast is set to receive Ireland's first hydrogen powered double decker bus before the end of 2020. And that's the first major step to decarbonise transport. Um, and Seamus is questioning uh, why are energy providers like Electric Ireland allowed to charge for under usage? Would anybody like to comment on that? I don't feel. I think it's uh, when they talk about energy usage, I think that happens in, when they talk about gas. Uh, and that's a factor of the, as opposed to electricity. I'm not aware that anybody underuses uh, electricity, but certainly gas, where they've gone in and purchased gas on the open market, and they've made contracts uh, to that effect. It's a little bit different in that gas, we are at the end of the pipeline, as opposed to electricity, we generate our own in the, in the vast majority of the case of electricity. Okay, John. Thank you very much for, for those insights and uh, there's a lot to think about there. So having heard from you, John, um, based in the Republic of Ireland, our final speaker is Michael Legg from the Consumer Council, who brings a, a Northern Ireland perspective to some of these matters. Currently the head of the Energy Policy Unit at the Consumer Council, Michael brings a vast experience from a range of former positions in a various consumer advocacy bodies over the last number of years and he will take us through our options as consumers and customers of the energy companies and I'm sure he will have pointers for us all. Okay, so Michael, over to you. There you yeah, go. Yeah. Uh, thanks guys, um, it's a real good opportunity to be here, so thanks very much soon and the team for, for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, and in terms of obviously already being introduced and work for the Consumer Council, so maybe, maybe useful just to touch upon um, we bet about the Consumer Council, so we've been around from the, the mid 80s, um, and our role is in around you know promoting safeguarding the interests of consumers. And we do that in a number of ways, and I kind of linked into this presentation. We do that in the round by providing information, you know, for consumers to try and help them make informed choices. Um, and we also have specific roles. Um, the one today is around energy. We also look at postal services, financial services transport and things like that there so i think one of the presenters earlier made a really good point in there around um, incomes and things like that there now our, when we're, we're looking at our work we look at sort of income levels and things like that there and across the uk northern ireland and um, weekly income level is probably the lowest in in the uk it, it sits at around maybe it's a couple of years old now but it's still still useful it's in around weekly and um, before housing costs about 439 pounds per week. Now, the reason why that's important, it's all about, you know, what the income and coming into your household and obviously your outgoings and things like that there. Um, another interesting study that we would look at is the, there's a household tracker and it's asked and it also for a five site, you know, in terms of across the UK, discretionary income, Northern Ireland again, is the lowest part of the, the UK um, in around about £119 per week. You compare that to the likes of London, it sits at about 265. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is obviously the pressure on, on household budgets. And also there, there's lots of sort of information out there. There's the household spending survey that they, they do. And what it shows is consumers in Northern Ireland, we spend, you know, a, a bit more, about 16% more um, a week on energy. So leading from that, I think it's really important for people to, you know, mentioned you know, kind of, kind of trying to create tools and information and advice to help people help themselves as best they can. So that that's what this little presentation focuses on. It's in the round, you know, how to look out, you know, for different providers and how, how you might be able to save money on your your energy bills. And yeah, so we've got the in in Northern Ireland and. Um, what what we've done, we've, de we've developed a free impartial price comparison tool. Um, and the purpose of that, I've already mentioned, try it's trying to get people to see what, what's the best deal that they can get. Can they save a little bit of money on their energy bills and their, and their electricity bills? And they, the tool that we've got, you know, it's, it's we, we think it's pretty straightforward and simple in that it's um, 
got five easy steps and it gets you down to the point where what's the best tariff that you can get and get it in a little straight later on with a, a little video. And um, other speakers have mentioned this too. Um, home heating oil is a big thing in Northern Ireland. The thing what well, well, the, the information that we have is around 68% of households across Northern Ireland obviously look at it and use home heating oil. Um, and within that, what we do there now, we don't have a tool at the moment, but what we do, we, we monitor what's going on across Northern Ireland um, and we call suppliers and what we try and do there is create efforts on our website too, information about you know how much lowest, highest average would be in your area to give you an idea and um, where you might be able to save some money. Probably what I would say, and it's worth mentioning in the, the oil industry, it's not regulated. Um, so. Probably what I would say on that there, you know, some, some consumer, general consumer rights do apply, you know, when, when you're when you're using oil, you know, your service, the, the service, the goods have to be a satisfactory, satisfactory quality and they have to be fit for fit for purpose as well. And in terms of the electricity suppliers across Northern Ireland, we've got, we've got five um, electricity providers, so you can see them on the screen, they're listed in, and we might quite soon have a, a new entrant to the market in, um, maybe within the next month or so, which is good, because one of our principles that we look at at a high level, you know, is, is competition, you know, improve consumer choice and the benefits that may bring, you know, in terms of competitive price and reducing price and maybe more innovative products and things like that. They're obviously, you know, the customer service experience connected into that, you know, to, to, to give that overall much better consumer experience. Now, what we would say within the, the energy, the energy is coming into your home, electricity is coming into your home. And the scenario that we use is, if, for instance, you're, you're in a coffee shop and you, you go up there and you get the, your coffee and you're, you're paying £3.50 on it, your friends beside you, and they order the, exactly the same thing and they're getting charged two quid. You know, you'd be, you'd, you'd be sitting there, what's that about? That's why I might be in charge that extra. So that, that's what we're saying is make sure you shop around and see where you can get savings and... Yeah, try try and get those those bills down um, as best that you can, um, and and manage your finances much better um, in that their respect. So to give you an idea in terms of you know how much you can save now, this is based on sort of just an average comparison. You know, one of them, you know, it'll depend upon people's individual circumstances, but depending on the type of media that you have, uh, payment methods and things like that, there you could save potentially up to you know about one hundred and forty pounds. You know, by switching. And that, that's where our electricity price comparison tool comes in. So we would certainly recommend people to, to use that. Um, and, and what you might also think about is if you're on a prepayment meter as well, you know, can it monitor how much you're using on that? There is to give an idea, you know, you know, how much can I save with the, with the prepayments if, if you're on that type of meter? And this is this page here, this is directly from our website. And what it actually showed is kind of the, the front face of our switching tool. And the, the tool itself, probably what I would say, it was it's one of our most popular resources that we've got um, within the consumer council. The usage of it's very high and it's been growing for a number of years. For instance, this year from April to September, it's been used about 33,000 times, um, which is you know, it's quite a lot. So. Hopefully people are using it and they're saving money um, and, and getting better deals. So the next one I'm going to show is, and hopefully this all goes to plan, um, is our little video. So what I'll do, I'll stop talking for a moment and just play this. And this will take you a step-by-step -step guide um, on how to use the comparison tool. Well, the Consumer the Consumer Council has a range of tools to help you save money on your home energy costs and make sure you are getting the best deal. This video is a step-by-step -step guide of how to use the electricity price comparison tool. Have a copy of your latest bill handy. You will need it to check which product you are currently using and how much electricity you are using. Choose your energy type. In this instance, click electricity. Select your current supplier. Choose your current payment method. You will either have a credit meter where you get a bill or a prepayment meter that you top up online or at a local shop. E-bill means you receive your bill by email. 
If you have a prepayment meter, you would need to request a meter change if you want to switch to a credit meter. If you currently get your bill in the post, you might wish to change to e-billing and set up a direct debit. This option can save you money. After you have selected how you pay currently and how you wish to pay, click continue. Select your current tariff, which is the product you have, then select the frequency you pay, either every other month, monthly or quarterly. How much is your average bill? Check your latest bill to find this information and then simply enter this into the tool. Your results are then calculated instantly. The results page lists the number of tariffs available that can save you money. The tool gives you an estimate of how many units you use in a year and how much you normally spend. Please read the information for each product as this explains standing charges, exit fees, maximum charges, and if it's available to new customers only. Remember, you can always contact suppliers by phone or email to discuss tariffs to make sure you're definitely getting the best rate possible. Click on more information to get contact details for the supplier and get in touch to make the switch. We hope this video has been useful. If you need any assistance, call our consumer protection team on 0800 121 6022 and they can help you use the tool. So that, that's guy, that's a little short video about the sort of step by step guide for the tool. So if you if you haven't maybe used it already, you know, please do, you know, please share it with friends, family or anybody within your community, you know, and the tools are sort of used and to help people. And we're also looking this year to try to develop the tool in some way. So if you have used it or you would like to use it, you have any ideas, you know, you can go onto our website and you can by all means click through a wee bit of feedback if you think there's something that we might be able to do to, to improve that and we can certainly have a look at that there. And um, now we've got lots of other um, resources on our website and these are like switching guides and I've mentioned them before, you know, our electricity price comparison tables. So they're just PDFs, you can download those and you can see sort of the unit costs. And in terms of the previous one, we've got an economy seven one, which compares the, the day and night rates as well. So you can get an idea what they look like um, across the different suppliers and also across the different methods that they they use in terms of their products and services that, that they're using. Um, so yeah, there's lots of information there. So please, please do use that um, and hopefully you'll, you'll get some use out of that there. Now, what we mentioned at the start is that the oil um, touched upon this. And what we do here is this is a, it's just a snapshot from our website again. And this is a, what we call our price survey that we do every week. And we publish the results on a, every Thursday. And the idea of this it's again is to give you the average prices um, so that you can, you can see what's the average, the cheapest or the most expensive and we also do the average cost per litre on there too. And the reason for that is um, when you're, if you're on oil and you're using oil, you know, use that information, that haggle with them when you're ringing up to speak to them. You know, just don't accept the, the first price that they give you. Just, yeah, just go and ask them, listen, this is the best price you can do. And that, that table will be there every Thursday and updated regularly. So it's also a popular one that we have as well. Um, and... This again was touched upon by um, the NEA, and it's, I think it's a really important thing to flag up as well, and it's around these customer car registers. They, they're there, and they're there to benefit people, particularly people maybe are more vulnerable or need more assistance. So there's the, there's the two that were previously mentioned, there's the customer car register and the critical car register, and the, the suppliers, you know, they have to keep those registers, they have details, people maybe special needs, people who are older, disability or long-term sick. And then um, that, that, that is there for them and make you get, get you free assistance and additional services in where they can help, for instance, large print password protected schemes, you know, if a, if a representative calls from a service provider. And the thing would be is ring them up, speak to your supplier if you need to be on that, make sure you get on that. And there was also the, the one that mentioned previously as well and around the, you know, around the clock electrical equipment and the supply there, which is obviously really important for people if they need, need that around the clock, and that's the NIE Networks Register. So again, th those organizations are out there, they have those registers, and um, if you need them, get registered for them, and they should, 
that they're there for to, to be able to help you guys. Um, and that brings me to the, the end of the presentation. So I'm happy to take any comments or any questions that people may have. Michael, thank you for that. Um, just to, to, to a question uh, about the customer care register. You, I know that um, Nicola mentioned that you know if you were registered blind or you know, there were a range of things she mentioned. But do you do you actually need to be registered disabled to be on that, or can you self-select because of you know something that you consider needs to be thought of? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, no, you would ring them and explain, explain your circumstances to them and they should take all that into consideration. You know, it's it's there for, you know, people who, it's, you know, they've got, they've got a disability or they all have long, long term sick. It's not like, you know, like a benefit sort of check thing that yeah. way there, but that scheme, it, it is really important. And we kind of, we've mentioned this before um, in terms of COVID and things like that there, that's going on at the moment, I think. Yeah, if in terms of, you, you froze up a wee bit there, um, I don't know if it's my connection, but in terms of, yeah, anybody can go on to that tool for their friends and family and just sit down with them. I mean, definitely we would recommend that and take them through it, the process. Now, the, the tool will only get you so far. It will give you all the information and then the, it would be then be down to you to get in contact with a supplier, you know, that, that's popped up maybe on our tool and you would say, listen, yeah. we've become aware of this here and we would we'd like to look at that there. Probably what I would say um, in terms of if, if the deal is maybe an online, you know, like online billing and things like that, they're obviously the thing might be where obviously the person, you know, the household, you know, are they online? Can they get access to their bills? Because mm -hmm. um, someone made the point earlier in terms of, you know, keeping keep on top of your bills and meter readings and things like that. There. So that, that might be something to be aware of. But if you're able to find within your household, if someone can help you with that, learning it's a better day. You know, I don't see why you wouldn't want to save yourself a few pounds um, and maybe spend it elsewhere. Um, and in terms of, like I say, you know, the pressure to, obviously we're all conscious of what's going on in the, in the, the wider world and, and the, the pressure households are going to be under in terms of their income, you know, and um, it's kind of every penny counts. Obviously, that won't solve everything, but it's kind of that that, that mindset is trying to be as as active or helpful Entry really. Yeah. Now what what well I'll, I'll, I'll check in that there and I can come back to you, maybe share to, to the group. But I think what we do is we do across the local councils, you know, we do a sample of suppliers across um, and so you should be able to get for instance, um, whatever area you're from, you should be able to do a comparison. I'll actually go on just now just to make sure. And, but yeah, no, I'm pretty sure it's definitely across all the councils. Okay. We should be able to target that in terms of the home heating oil. That's lovely. Thank you, Michael. Um, I see Gem is saying that the energy advice line, and she's given the number there, will certainly take anybody through the tool. Uh, they have a data matrix that can take someone through their own specific home energy efficiency costs. And uh, Shona Connor is asking, are there any schemes for vulnerable families that require electric in emergencies? Some children's ch charities try to pay for electric out of their fundraising to help families in need. Um, would anybody like to comment on that? Anybody more qualified than me? No, I'm, uh, Sean, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I can certainly try to find out for you. Um, okay. Are there any other questions? Sorry. Sorry. Just an in um you know oil uh, pills for the winter and all of that you know what i mean so i'm sure there's other charities there as well in the north um that yes well so St. Vincent de Paul are, are obviously across the in the entire uh, country so um but outside of the, the that sector i'm not sure that there's anything um any other support available um, is there someone from the council on that um 
Right, so sorry there, Catherine is saying Bryson Energy provides emergency fuel grants. So there are there are some other options there, Shauna, if uh, that answers your question. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Michael, could could I ask you to stop oh, so, sharing so your so screen if that's okay? All right, no, it's okay. It's just a little. Secondly, um, the councils, yeah, we definitely have it on our website all the different councils, the sort of lowest and highest yes. costs against the different things. So that, that might help people too. I'll stop sharing the screen now, guys. Sorry. No, thank you. Okay, are there any other comments anyone wants to make? No? That's lovely. Michael, thank you. That was a most informative and useful presentation. Um, I think if there's nothing else, um, if no one's coming in with any other questions, we can uh, bring the event to a close. Um, and I suppose that it ends our event this morning. I want to thank our three contributors, Nicola. McDowell from NEA, John from SEAI and Michael Legg and I think we got three very uh, useful perspectives on uh, the issues uh, that are many fold and I suppose are going to be even uh, more relevant I think this winter. Um, it's evident that they're all very knowledgeable in their various fields and I hope you found it as instructive as I have. Um, we have had a timely reminder of how we can address some of these issues uh, that we may have to deal with either personally or professionally over the coming months. Uh, it is important to know that there's help out there and indeed things that we can do to help ourselves. Um, and I suppose I finally want to thank all of you, the participants in the webinar. Time is a precious commodity and I thank you for taking the time to join us. On a final note, following your involvement in today's event, you will receive an email with a short post-event questionnaire we would be very appreciative if you would take a couple of minutes to complete that and return it to us. Not only will it help us to refine any future events, but you will also have the opportunity to make uh, suggestions for areas for future events that you might feel would be useful. And for those of you attending in a personal capacity, returning that questionnaire will allow us to request, or will allow you to request the small package of energy saving tools and measures that we will uh, supply to you and we will, can organize how to get those to you. But many thanks again and enjoy the rest of your day and uh, take care everybody. Bye.